This is an intro. Intro, intro, intro. Hustle and flow chart with your boy, my boy, Matt Wolf, and Joe Fit. Hey. Welcome back. Hi. You actually let me go first this time. I know. You weren't expecting it, huh? No. I was like, I was just leaving silence thinking Joe was going to be like, hey, and try to get in first. I saw that. Yeah. I like to change it up here. Yeah. All right. That's what puts a little bit of a, I don't know, interesting. Yeah. Uh, we got to change it up, man. Every once in a while, you got to <laughs> you got to so got to keep things interesting. This, yeah, man. This was honestly one of my favorite discussions. Like, I this genuinely enjoyed this conversation. Um, not that I didn't enjoy conversations with other past guests, but I just I, I really appreciated this conversation. Let's, let's say it resonated the most for you. It resonated very much with me. Yes, you um, connected it. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things happening in our business right now where this episode was like freaking touching a nerve. Mm-hmm. You know. So we're talking to Richard Lindner today from. Co- uh, he's actually the co-founder and president of Digital Marketer. Yeah. So super cool because he gets into how he actually, uh, you know, his story. We always get into the story thing. But we heard some really cool, fascinating ways that he actually got into Digital Marketer and, and, and helped create this company now that has exploded. Yeah. And everybody in the digital online marketing space has probably heard of at least one of their assets or their core you know products or or events that they have out there yeah yeah i mean the, his story about how digital marketer got started and how he met perry belcher and how he connected mm-hmm. with ryan dice and how they came together to create digital marketer and how roland got involved and and just hearing this evolution of digital marketer i found was really really fascinating but there were so many just like little lessons along the way like he was yeah. telling the story of digital marketer while at the same time kind of weaving in like here's why this worked here's mm-hmm. why this didn't work and i i just thought it was a really really great episode and some of the things that we talk about on this outside of the story of digital marketer is how to effectively manage a team how to effectively lead people when you have four partners in a business how do you divide the roles between four people so you guys aren't kicking each other all and the they're time. they're not all like, they're all kind of remote. Uh, some of them, you know, Ryan and uh, Richard are there in the office with their team of, I believe he said about 50 people or so. So, I mean, they're ro- running a, you know, a real business. Yeah. <laughs> I but, definitely have a feeling we'll be chatting with Richard again soon, just because of, you know, I feel like we could have probably talked to him for another two hours and oh, yeah. it would have felt like a short episode still. Yeah, we, we <laughs> hopped in like we, uh, we've been chatting for a very long time. Yeah, so. I think this was it only was the fun. second time we've ever conversed with him. Um, but uh, yeah, you'll walk away with a ton of different assets and, and different things that you can take in your business and think differently. You know, he's lining out all these different um, ways that you run ideas through your company. Mm -hmm. So you're not constantly just chasing ideas and not knowing how to implement or which ones that you should just probably kill and not move forward with. But he has all these processes. He's a very process guy, but at the same time, you know, you can explain uh, this stuff very clearly to um, to folks to actually implement, and it's it's really cool. I think my favorite part was the four uh, things his spiel mm-hmm. that he gives every single person that that works oh. a digital marketer, and like literally that four. Uh, thing spiel. It's basically like four little sections. Yeah. Anybody can replicate that in their business and immediately you'll become way more effective with you and your team's time. Yeah. That's kind of the last rabbit hole we dive in right before we wrap up. So definitely stick around for that because it's definitely a huge highlight of the episode. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, let's tell them about the notes. The notes are going to be a very good one on this episode specifically. I'm going to be like foaming at the mouth for a while until we see them. So we take notes basically to like little action guides. That's how I like to see them mm-hmm. is that you don't have to worry about taking all these crazy notes. But, you know, in Richard's case here, he's going to give you a whole ton of, ton of different strategies, very specific wordings for things mm-hmm. like the four things like he uses very specific wording. Uh, those are the kind of things you want to see in written form. So we got your back and we did that. If you go to hustleandflowchart.com slash comp, C-O-M-P, that's hustleandflowchart.com slash comp. You can get that for free if you act quick because they do kind of rotate around there. Yeah. So you got to be quick. You'll get the full notes for this one, the action guide and all of these different things that we discuss. It's going to be really cool. cool. So, well, let's um, go talk to my new best friend, Richard. Hey, Richard, welcome on the show. Thanks, guys. Happy to be here. Yeah, man. So we're we're just doing a little chit chat right before this, talking about the fine dining out in NYC, and uh, 
<laughs> Sounds like yeah, I was I was, uh, I was doing some sit-ups right before that because of the fine dining out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it's 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 pretty cool because on Facebook and um you yeah, know we've had Roland on the show and we were chatting about him and he always he always shows off the you know the fine finer things in life the hotel rooms and you know the the chef's tables and whatnot <laughs> and it's just he it's pretty is, cool he is definitely um, one of the most amazing people to travel with uh, <laughs> I my guess is he's one of the worst people to unknowingly befriend on social media. You <laughs> have to look at this dude's life and be like, I am uh, woefully underprepared for this thing called life. Uh, I mean, <laughs> you know, it, it's funny because everyone I know gets to experience Roland in, in small spurts, but right. I don't think anybody actually realizes you're just stepping into his life for a day or so. Mm. Um, but when you leave, it's still just as amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a yeah. good. It's that perspective change. I think is healthy. You know, it just shows you what's possible in life, what's out there. Because most people don't yeah. open themselves up to that. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, that was actually one of the topic of our lunch conversations: is how do you, how do you continue to, uh, in a healthy way, or have a healthy relationship with a desire for growth, right? Without you know, kind of self loathing. Right. Or without yeah. being blind to what you have, um, you yeah. know, you, you don't want to aspire to have or to be more at the cost of belittling who you are or the accomplishments that you've had in your life. And, and that's just, mm. you know, those types of conversations for me are always fun. All right. Yeah. Um, because it can be really dangerous to start hating who you are because you want to be something better, but can also be uh, just as dangerous to become complacent, especially if you've got something uh, that could change the world or change some aspect of the world or change, you know, some subset of the population's life. Like you've got kind of a responsibility to go do that. 100%. So, you know, I don't know. It's, those are the kind of geeky conversations we talk about um, <laughs> after we nerd out over wine and, uh, and the appetizer list. <laughs> wine and whiskey. Yeah. Wine and whiskey. There you go. I feel, I feel like Matt and I have similar conversations all the time. Because <laughs> you're right. I think those are some of the most important conversations we can have with ourselves and others is to hold ourselves to a higher standard, but not beat ourselves up about things either. You know, yeah, so, we talk yeah. about it a lot um, here at Digital Marketer with the leadership team. Yeah, um, it's You've got to be really careful about um, your ideal self versus your actual self, mm -hmm. right? Like who's your ideal self? And then how are you, you know, how are you grading that person? Um, and, and who's your actual self? And what are kind of those what are those, those, those milestones along the way that you can look back and go, I'm making progress. And how are you grounding your ideal self in your actual self? So that you, again, it just, you avoid self-hatred, self-loathing. When you look in the mirror, you need to say, you know, I like this person. I like the people around me. That's why I want to be better. But let's be honest, who I am is, is, is good. It may not be good enough for what I want to do, but that doesn't mean it's not good enough. Mm, uh, yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, I think that's what we miss in this, in a culture of just grow, 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 grow is, you know, this, I don't know, this idea that you have to also go back and say, um, not everybody gets a ribbon, not everybody's good enough for what they want to do, but that right. doesn't mean you're not good enough. Right. And, and I think that's, that's tough. We can, you look at the people who um, don't break through and get just addicted to these uh, personal development or professional development books, but never actually develop. Mm, yeah. To me, it seems like they're just in their own head with increasing the knowledge of the ways that they aren't good enough, not actually taking pieces out of these these books or, or this information and putting it into play to become better. Yeah. So that's something that I'm always fighting, dealing with a with an executive team that I'm charged to lead to grow these different companies is to make sure that they have a healthy relationship with themselves. Mm, yeah. Mm. Have you ever read the book You Squared by Price Pritchett? Pritchett. I haven't. No. Check that out, man. It's um, uh, John Asaraf was on the show, and he recommended this to us like oh, I love John. seven years ago. But he reads it like multiple times a year, and it's exactly what you're talking about. Is there's a lot of roadblocks or knowledge that we all have, and and most of us try to, you know, as entrepreneurs, I feel like we're all ingrained. Even folks working for DM, I'm sure, digital marketer, a lot of them have these tendencies, entrepreneur tendencies to always be better, push, 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 work harder. You right. know, there's always more, but. A lot of us forget like, oh, yeah, you might not have to like break the wall down. You could just like open the door that's behind you or next to you that you're not looking at. 
So there's right. usually yeah, and, a better and way. <laughs> why do you want to grow? And and one of the questions that I you know that I'll I'll ask people um, who report to me or who I'm charged with with leading in one mm-hmm. way or another is you know who are you who are you grading yourself against? Like let's let's come up with really healthy figures and let's make sure that depending on what areas of life you're focusing on. Um, that you, you are, you understand the cost of achieving those things, mm. right? If, if you want to look at, if you want to go out and take, well, I'm going to take Elon and, and Howard Schultz, and, and then I'm going to take a little bit of Branson and, and, mm. oh, um, uh, uh, you know what? Let's also kind of pepper in, uh, Phil Knight. Let's do some, let's do some <laughs> stuff there. Yeah. Well, it's great to look at everything they were really, really exceptional at, but the flip side of every coin, like, you know, do you believe that the relational collateral that, that, comes with some of those native genius is worth it and even necessary. So how are you gauging yourself? Who are you grading yourself against? What can you learn from their failures and their successes to, to try to achieve what they've achieved or your version of it without the collateral damage along the way? Like you owe it to them for putting themselves out there and documenting what they've done uh, in whatever narrative to learn from their mistakes and, and try to do, to do that without those same mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, this. yeah. <laughs> anyway, Mark, marketing junk. Yeah. Well, I, we'll definitely be circling back around to a lot of this, I think, because this is all stuff that just fascinates us, and it's very topical for us and where we're at in our business right now as well. Hundred um, percent. So I definitely want to circle back around to this and 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 talk about the leadership um, the philosophies that that you guys have and that sort of thing. Uh, but before we do, I'm kind of I'm I'm curious about your journey to where you are today. You know, how did what were you doing before this? How did you get involved in digital marketer? You know, what what was your entrepreneurial journey? Um, you know, how, just kind of let us know how you got to where you are, and let's uh, let's kind of start there. Yeah, it's um, it's definitely, and I'm guessing like most people, not you know, it wasn't intentional or the direct path or even what mm-hmm. I thought I would do. Um, my family's always been pretty entrepreneurial, but, uh, kind of early on, at least in the last endeavor, they got popped pretty hard. Like mm-hmm. my dad quit an amazing corporate job left and, and opened up, um, kind of a, a convenience store gas station. I remember I was about seven years old. And I got to name it. Oh, wow. uh, I remember where I remember when I, where we were at in the car, when I named it, we're going to call it the family market. Uh-huh. And that's what we called it. And just through a series of unfortunate events and zoning, couldn't end up getting gas pumps. My dad had done his due diligence. Uh, had really modeled everything around uh, the profitability of, of having this convenience store located where it was and in, in, in proximity to a couple of neighborhoods and having the revenue from gas, but ended up not being able to permit gas, um, kind of broke my family uh, mm. in, in, in a way, not not like relationally, but just, you know, my, we got super lucky. You know. My dad had built up such an amazing career at, at this corporate company. He was able to go back uh, to them same position, like do all some really amazing stuff. So I was always encouraged entrepreneurially, uh, came from an entrepreneurial family, uh, but also saw the perils early. Mm. Um, so I think in growing up and in, in these different entrepreneurial endeavors that I've always kind of uh, gravitated towards, um, I always kind of remembered the family market, right? What is the thing that you're not thinking about that the best plan in the world could destroy? All your due diligence gone because of this thing. So um, a digital marketer came about and my passion uh, kind of towards Ryan and what he was doing when we met. Uh, I think the undertone of how do I provide um, that X factor, the things that, that maybe could have kept my family, like did they need gas pumps, right? Mm-hmm. Was, that, mm-hmm. was, was it really necessary or was that the logical lie we, we told each other because we didn't know how to, to better sell what we had. Mm-hmm. So kind of, you know, that... Entrepreneur, entrepreneurism has always been in, in my blood and my family. I've always kind of gravitated towards it. Um, but then at some point I decided I was going to go into business um, and, you know, be a, be a businessman. <laughs> uh, I was actually first, I went into accounting and then later transferred in, into to finance. Um, graduated, was going to go to work uh, at Morgan Keegan uh, in mm-hmm. the fixed income division, which um, I, I thank uh, everything that I can think of to thank. That I didn't do that because uh, had I, um, just a couple short months later, things would have would have kind of fallen apart. So, uh, graduated, yeah. uh, had worked and, and built a strip mall with a with a friend's uh, dad. Put a couple of businesses in that. Uh, mm-hmm. Sold my interest in the business. Sold the strip mall. You know, graduated college. Went uh, to my kind of first day at uh, Morgan 
Keegan and quit at lunch. Oh and my. Along, yeah, it was, it was tough. I remember walking in and, and saying like, man, the opening speech was if you work really hard for the next you know, five to seven years as a sales assistant, then you can move up and you can get your series seven, your series 11 and become a junior broker. And then you're just a couple of years away from making a hundred grand. And I'm thinking, holy crap, I'm only going to make a hundred grand. <laughs> like wow. what? I've made more than that already. Like last year, I've, I'm taking a giant pay cut and if opportunity is measured in decades, then this isn't for me. And I told, I told the guy and I walked away. Uh, and along kind of the, the course of this, I've gotten gotten married, met my wife, my wife went to work for this crazy guy who sold stuff on the internet. Mm -hmm. Um, he and I met, his name was Perry Belcher. Uh, we became best friends, (laughs) super crazy guy, but we became best friends in in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, and he became a a mentor. And I remember he called me the day that, that day said, man, how did it go? How was your first day? And I said, dude, I've been at the bar at the Fox and the Hound since lunch. Oh man. And he said, I'll be right there. And we left at 2 a.m. Uh, and I don't know if there was a wow. bar napkin left in that place. Wow. And they were all covered with ideas and business plan. Like, what if we did this? And, and it, it, it couldn't have been, the, these ideas couldn't have been further apart. Uh, I think the first, the next thing you know, I was the king of blank um, uh, DVD or, or DVD media. We were importing uh, DVD rewritable DVDs from China and selling them in bulk uh, and, and all these just random things. But it came from that, that, you know, quitting and, and, and hanging out with Perry. And it hit me when I was driving home. I feel pretty damn good for just quitting my job. Like my entire plans were out the door. And the fact that I just sat down with one of those brilliant people I'd ever met, but also one of the scariest guy who didn't really seem to understand consequence in life. Like <laughs> things does, like does if I don't still? have money, how do I eat? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I was more calm. And this would, when I kind of knew like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't know why, uh, but it's what I'm supposed to be doing. And this dude seems crazy, but one of the most amazing uh, and giving people in the world. And, and I think I'm supposed to be doing it with him. So, uh, we were in a, a mastermind, um, Perry was, and then I would go to the mastermind and, and, uh, what this guy had, Yannick Silver had two masterminds. He had, mm-hmm. uh, kind of an eight figure or seven figure earner and a six figure earner. And Perry was in the, the seven figure. And then there were a couple guys in the six figure earner that were waiting to move up. Um, and he'd, he'd always do this kind of commingling thing. And, mm-hmm. and that guy's name was Ryan Dice. Uh, we met, we became friends. Um, and then, you know, a couple of years later, we decided to, uh, to start working together. And, and a few years after that, Ryan and I kind of shared our vision for what a digital marketer could be after the third year of Traffic and Conversion Summit. Wow. We decided that we were, we were pretty in line with, with that vision and both passionate about the same thing. So uh, we kind of co-founded Digital Marketer. Uh, all of us together, but really with Ryan and I taking the lead on on building this this platform out while Perry went uh, and and handled our consumer divisions. Yeah. So how interesting! Crazy That's... story. Yeah. That that I could go into any <laughs> any one part for the rest of this episode, and we could <laughs> laugh and probably hit the bleep button a couple of times. Uh, oh, there's no bleep part. button here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. You're good, but um, but yeah, that's as short as I think I can get it. But that's definitely so cool. nothing you would have planned. <laughs> that's all right. What's the craziest idea that came from that bar experience at Perry? Okay, I'm gonna say this, and I don't know if he wants this said. <laughs> I try to forget this. I remember where so Perry, being Perry, who again is one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. I mean, his brain just operates in a different way. He came up to me and he was like, "Hey." Living wills. I was like, "What?" He goes, "Have you have you heard? Have you been following the story in the news?" And this is forever ago. I don't expect anyone to remember this, and, and I'm I'm not making light of it. So Terry uh, Chavo, right, was mm-hmm. there was big national news. She didn't have a living will, and, and her husband and her parents both had different ideas about what should happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Perry, we were at the bar, and this comes up. And he's like. I own a law firm. I'm like, wait a second. Let's stop right there. <laughs> what did you just say? He's like, yeah, I own a law firm in Washington, D.C. Is like, wait, I don't understand. Normal people don't just own law firms. Like, I don't understand what you mean. He's like, yeah, it's on Pennsylvania Avenue. I'm like, what the <laughs> hell are you talking about? Like, no, I own a law firm. I got a guy. We've got a mailing address here. He's a he's an amazing lawyer. Um, it's it, it, Here's the law firm. 
And I really think that right now there's an amazing amount of awareness. Oddly enough, what this dude does, living wills and estate planning. We can launch a site tomorrow and start selling living wills online. And I'm telling you, we're just going to ride kind of this media wave right now. Yeah. Plus, people need it. And that was the cool. It was like, people need this. Like, look at this. Uh, <laughs> it, it's there. We have the opportunity to do it. And that was a really big lesson. Yeah. Like, sometimes there's what you think you're going to do. And then sometimes that opportunity is just so big. And the need is there. And, and, and while you always have to gauge opportunity cost, Sometimes we, we put too heavy of a weight on that opportunity cost when we don't really know how big it could be. So mm. next thing you know, we're selling uh, blank writable media and living wills. Wow. And that was, I mean, that was about a 20 minute conversation. Perry built the website that night himself. I think that night was like a Friday night and to, to qualify that Friday night, we drank the fox and the hound out of not one, but two types of vodka. So he went home and, and did it after that. It was several years ago. Uh, he went home and he built the website after that. And I think I woke up Saturday morning to him saying, hey, you need to call the guy in D.C. because we've got some orders for the living will. I was like, wait, that's you were that's a thing. OK. <laughs> Wow. Well, that just shows you how, you know, it's, it's, you know, analysis of paralysis kind of whole thing. Like Perry doesn't have that, obviously. You know, you, you, and I think a lot of high level people that just know how to get shit done, it does that. You like, you see a concept, you're like, yeah, what's the worst thing that can happen? Eh, It didn't sound like much. You have a website and a connection to a lawyer. Cool. All right. Let's try some leads. Yeah. (laughs) That's amazing. I mean, and, and this was back when you could, I mean, you go on to, to Google, we're not far from the overture days. I mean, you'd go on mm-hmm. to Google and you could buy, you could start a campaign immediately, you know, uh, page rank, page score. That wasn't a thing. You could, you could buy traffic to anything mm-hmm. and know whether it was going to work in minutes. I mean, it was, it mm-hmm. was where Google then was where Facebook was three, four, five years ago. Yeah. Uh, probably three years ago. seems like a lot further, but you could just buy traffic to whatever you wanted and it kind of worked out yeah. uh, or it didn't, but you knew it wasn't Google that, that came in and you know slapped you or banned you for life or anything like that. So it was a very different time. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, the, the, the funny thing always was in waking up on, on, you know, Friday or, or any day really and figuring out what Perry decided we were going to make and sell <laughs> Um, and, and built the website. I mean, he'd log into one shopping cart. He'd pull up front page, knock out a website, write amazing copy, yeah. create the, the virtual pics and, and create the Google campaign. And everyone else in the company would wake up to orders and then figure out how to fulfill it, which is amazing. And you're right. Like there are people that just aren't um, tethered by the same constraints as the rest of us are. Yeah. The thing that took a really long time to realize is that does um, that does have a have a cost, right? There's a price to pay for that if you never mature as a business or a brand, mm-hmm. and that price is usually people, mm-hmm. um, because the people who do uh, who who do have those constraints, right? Your your operators, mm-hmm. um, if, you know, uh, your implementers, um, they can't live in that world without being burnt out uh, or broken for sure. for large periods of time. So. It's, it's great. And you've got to know how to go there as a company, even mature companies. You just have to know when you've been there long enough to call it a success or a failure and then move it into a real business with real processes designed by people who that is their native genius. Mm. Yeah. Do you guys ever these days, do you ever like jump at ideas like that anymore? Do you ever kind of like have a late night idea session and then like the next day you're like, let's, let's just build this and see what happens. Or are those days kind of a little bit harder to a little bit. They don't come quite as frequently, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. And they do, they don't come, um, not, they don't come as freely. And uh, if they do come, they're not as without constraints. Right? right. I mean, we have, we have, we have partnership agreements, both legal binding agreements and agreements with, with one another on the units that, that we will own the P and L right. That, that we have a, a an operating board, um, and we kind of agree to what we're going to do and, and what results we're going after and, and how we're going to get there. Um, because we believe that we're building something that's, that's valuable. Um, not, and, and we believe that we can build value and profit 
at the same time. So when we have those sessions, they're typically constrained by at least the holding companies that we have. Like there's no spin up a new business overnight or uh, spin up a new product. And when we do spin up a new product, like Ryan recently dove in and, and then he and I, uh, him doing most of the work, me jumping in after, uh, mm-hmm. just enough to be categorized as us, you know, so I get some of the credit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know. It uh, but but created um, kind of a, a, a totally new product line here, a digital marketer that we'll be releasing in the next, um, hopefully, 30 days. Nice. But that was done, you know, diving in and, and building everything without the team. Now, instead of just going in and launching it and, and saying and waiting for someone in customer care to come in and say, hey, what is this <laughs> question this person's asking? Or what the heck is this order that someone's asking how they access? Uh, which happened for several years. Um, now we go in and we make sure that we innovate, we create, then we inform the company, partner with the stakeholders to roll it out. So it's a different process. Um, but the key mm-hmm. for us has been how do you, how do you still have that, uh, have that, that spirit, right? That entrepreneurial spirit. How do you still have mm-hmm. that blue ocean and capitalize on those things without disrupting your company? Mm-hmm. Uh, or, or at least, controlling the chaos or controlling the disruption because if you can't harness it right. if you're just breaking your people then you're not going to have a company that that builds upon the native genius of everyone there uh it's going to be you know people who've outlasted and i'll tell you some people that can outlast that you want to be there and others you don't because they're just numb to it they just outlast it because they're oblivious they don't mm. they don't feel anything yeah yeah no, that's interesting. I remember we we had Roland on. He's actually been on the tw- the show twice. And the first time we had him on, he actually broke down this massive process that he follows with spreadsheets and scores and it's his idea uh, scorecard. Yeah, basically. yeah, the idea scorecard yeah. where he breaks down every single potential opportunity at the moment and then scores them and then figures out which opportunity to pursue. So you know, I, I'm I'm kind of envisioning like those those sort of idea sessions happening. And then the next day rolling going, okay, let me plug it into the spreadsheet and see if it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, um, and, and Roland, I mean, one Roland Mensa. So to, to understand kind of Roland's algorithms first, like, I mean, <laughs> be the kind of smart that geniuses go, wow, that's smart. Uh, yeah, but if you yeah. want to, you know, a, a kind of a simpler version, uh, Sean Ellis writes about kind of his ice, um, system in hacking growth. Uh, yeah. and it's a, it's a simple rating scale. That's going to look at impact, confidence, and ease. Oh, yeah. And, and for us internally, that's, that's what we're looking at. Like what, Im- what's the potential impact this could have? Uh, what confidence level do we have that, that we can pull that off? Like, do we know how to do it? Have we done it before? Has someone that we know, or do we have contacts in our Rolodex of, of people who have done this that we can call on if we get stuck? Mm-hmm. And then the ease, what's the ease of, 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 of doing this. Um, you know, I, like you guys, when, when it was launch a podcast and that was a, that was an example I used forever mm. when we would, we, when I was kind of teaching our version of this inside of a marketing growth aspect and saying, um, if you were going to rewrite homepage copy or an indoctrination campaign versus launching a podcast, mm-hmm. you know, what impact could it have? They both could be pretty high. What confidence level can have? Well, I mean, Lots of people have big, comp, uh, big, big podcasts. Lots of people have, um, you know, uh, very successful indoctrination campaigns that get people, uh, you know, kind of indoctrinated with with their brand, get them to, to kind of um, go all in. And then I, we came to ease, and it's like, well, I I can write an email campaign. I can change a uh, homepage copy. I mean, when we were launching podcasts, we talked to you guys. We came to you guys because mm-hmm. my guess is we may be completely flipped mm-hmm. on those two. If you were like, you may, may, I don't know, I don't know your email marketing or uh, prowess, but you may be like, man, I'd much rather launch a podcast, yeah. both because I know how to do it and because it's fun, than write an email campaign. <laughs> and <laughs> that's both. what I'm talking yeah. about. <laughs> yeah, your, your Rolodex, right? Who do you know that it may not be your native genius, but it's theirs? And as you start to build that, that's yeah. why places like War Room are so fantastic because uh, everyone's native genius combined and, and, and you've got just this think tank. So. Yeah, man. We do have a rating system internally, uh, and again, that that hacking growth book by Sean Ellis is, is a great read. 
yeah, and the ice. Yeah, it's a little simpler than Roland uh, you know, using his big old right. checklist all the time. And yeah. I like how you said Roland's algorithms because <laughs> he is like a computer. He's basically Google. He is. And <laughs> Roland has an operating system and an algorithm that that not only can I not legally disclose, but I don't think I can articulate because yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not smart enough. <laughs> So no mere mortal. Yeah. I'm curious. So right. there's, you know, you, you kind of mentioned, you made a comment about how like each each team member, or I, I guess each owner, each co-founder, sort of owns an element on the profit and loss sheet. And I'm I'm kind of curious how that that team dynamic works with I, I four owners, right? There's there's you, there's yeah. Ryan, Perry, and Roland, right? Correct. So yeah. how does how does that so, dynamic work between the four of you? And you know how does how do you guys not step on each other's toes in the business all the time? <laughs> so um, that is the secret sauce, right? That's the thing that that we struggled with forever. Uh, I say secret sauce. It's what it's not the secret sauce. It's a great question. Um, <laughs> we for the longest time, the things that would paralyze us were more uh, decision by committee. Mm. Right. And, and at the end of the day, when looking at it, it was like, man, had we just done either of these two or three or four, or however many people had a decision, um, everything, it doesn't matter. The, the, the result would have been uh, somewhere exponentially larger than nothing, uh, which is what we have now. So we started to go in and realize um, a, that was a, kind of the same time we realized that we have all these companies and we will switch our focus from one company that we've got built up to a lot of momentum and kind of trending in the direction that it needs to be. Now we've got a, either a new project or an existing project that maybe dipped a little bit that everyone moves their focus over and it becomes spinning plates mm -hmm. and just keeping them all spinning is, is difficult. So we're having these, these conversations about how do we, how do we simultaneously grow all of the companies? And then how do we also, um, establish lanes, roles and responsibilities mm -hmm. so that, uh, there's some autonomy between the, between the different partners. Um, and we kind of came to two decisions. One, we need to document and systemize all of our processes. And that's where digital marketer was born. And mm -hmm. two, uh, we need to look for existing frameworks. And what we came up with is, is almost the VC world, right? Uh, when mm -hmm. you look at these portfolios that are managed by, by different partners, and that's what we, we moved over to. So we, we all kind of decided that, you know, Perry had um, a ton of history in, in kind of uh, consumer goods and mm -hmm. taking products to, to retail, uh, dealing with buyers and, and, and manufacturing and, and that whole deal. And, and Ryan and I had none um, right. whatsoever. So Perry would head up the consumer division uh, and then Ryan and I would head up kind of the business division. Um, so, and then Roland actually bought in and when he came in, you know, Roland was not only the smartest person. I don't think we knew that yet. We knew mm -hmm. he was incredibly smart. I don't think I think I don't think he let us know that he was the smartest person yet. Uh, <laughs> he waited a couple of years and just sprinkled it out over the first. He wanted few to set years. his roots in the digital marketer first, and then <laughs> that's, be like, that's, that's right. And he wasn't a uh, living trust attorney at the time in D.C., was he? He was not. Okay, definitely not him. <laughs> yeah, thank thank you for clearing that up. Although. Wouldn't the story be so much better if you were? <laughs> I didn't put it together, but yeah, that would have been amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so if we if we happen to edit this, well, let's just lie and say yeah. Because <laughs> it makes for a better story. I'm joking. joking. We'll send it to Roland right after. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I, I am encumbered by the truth, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, so we, we looked at these these kind of uh, portfolio companies and and split them up and had the autonomy and said, okay, basically we're gonna we're gonna act as a board. Uh, and we're going to act as a mastermind. So we need to mm. we need a framework for sharing what's working because it, it, we don't want to swing the pendulum too far the other way. It's stupid if we're both solving the same problems or if I'm solving a problem that you solved two quarters ago or, or a month ago or a year ago, if you just have the answer. So, mm -hmm. uh, but how do we not step on each other's toes? We make sure that um, we know what decisions are made by the board, what decisions are made by kind of the, the GM or the portfolio holder. Uh, and, and we go from there. Roland came in and he headed up just basically M and A, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That's where he came from. And, and looking at all of our stuff, he, Roland was basically how do we think bigger? Um, uh, I mean, that's his. On top of being ridiculously smart and, and good at figuring everything out and kind of good looking, he also is just <laughs> the biggest thinker I know. Yeah. Uh, so he he's able to plus everything and come in and just force everybody to think bigger. And that was kind of his role. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's when things really kind of started to take off for us. So, you know, it, and that 
I think we can all look at things and say, what was the secret sauce there? What made that work? Um, and then how do we apply that to all aspects of our life here? I think it's really cool because we had a bunch of people that were really good at what they did. There was a lot of overlap in skills. So everybody did everything. Yeah. So yeah. when we, we were able to clearly define who does what, establish a communication and kind of um, guidelines, right? Set expectations for the relationship. So the other person either knows that they're exceeding or falling shy of those expectations, then it became healthy. And mm -hmm. then things just got really, really fun. Yeah. Is there a time that you've seen when working with other companies, uh, you know, outside of DM, but maybe some of your clients where it's a, uh, there's a point in time where you have to do this, like with a partner, do you think you should do this from the very beginning? Like have these clear expectations or is it just kind of like hustle and grind for a period? And then once you reach this point, then you can kind of start laying out more of the, I guess the corporate type structure, uh, yeah. kind of like what you have, to, you guys have. So I think begin with the end in mind, right? So yeah. it, what what kind of company? I mean, you got to have the conversations. Like Roland and I just had this conversation in New York, where it was like, okay, what do you what do you want to be? What do you want, Roland? So I think step one is make sure that if you're going to have a partner, that you're a, like you're in an alignment. The thing that we're always seeking uh, in all of our companies is alignment, mm. right? I want alignment between the the compensation structure and goals of my employees and the the goals and the profitability of the company. As long as those things are in alignment, companies work. The, if, yeah. if the people are growing professionally and, and, and you know, uh, uh, financially by the same activities that are causing the company to grow in value and profitability, do you think stuff's going to kind of work out? Oh yeah. 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 As long as you have a good product and, and you know, your market cap, you're like, your market's growing, not shrinking all those other things. But so alignment is super important. We're looking at, at the same kind of alignment from go. So when you're, when you're going into business with someone, you have to say, start with alignment, like make sure you're aligned in what you want the end result to be. Like, are you building some billion dollar company or are you having a you know lifestyle business? Mm -hmm. Are you wanting to build something up that, that employs, you know, hundreds of people or thousands of people, or you don't want to keep a super lean team, which it has a ceiling. Like, do you want to go into an office every day or do you kind of want to work from home? Like, start to have these conversations, make sure there's an alignment. But after you know that you're in alignment with vision, now talk about operating alignment. Someone has to be in charge. I love the book, uh, Gina Whitman, who wrote Traction, mm -hmm. uh, I think also wrote Rocket Fuel, yep. which is amazing. I love that book. It, it says, okay, basically, here's your, your visionary and here's your uh, um, implementer, implementer yeah. right? So a visionary implementer, understanding those two roles and it's contradictory as, you, as he goes through and breaks down the roles and responsibilities when he talks about the implementer, which is usually your number two, your president, your COO, whatever the heck you call it. I'm, I'm more of an implementer, mm -hmm. right? If we're looking at that framework, that's me. Yeah. Uh, when you're looking at your implementer, your implementer is the one who has ultimate kind of say over a lot of the resources that are deployed. So like here at Digital Marketer, Ryan's the CEO, I'm the president. When we're talking about the resources, like I own the PL. It's my responsibility for the PL. So when Ryan wants to make a an, an investment, we talk about that. Right? I'm gonna say, based on these things, I don't think we can make it, or based on these things, yeah, man, I think I think we can. Mm -hmm. Same thing with projects. So I think I say all that to say someone has to be in charge. Yeah. Because if you're partnering with someone, you're just building in um, kind of a, a stalemate. If you've got two people that are going into business together and they both are equals, there's there's what are you on the cap table and what are you on the org chart? And by God, they have to be different. Mm. Someone has to be in charge. You may be 50-50 partners on the cap table, but who's going to ultimately make the decision? And maybe it's maybe you split the decisions down the middle and you say, you know, these decisions are sales and marketing, or this is these are revenue decisions and these are operational decisions, and here's who kind of has ha, has the ultimate say over these different ones. But if you start with a structure that allows both people the uh, authority and, and charges them both with making a decision, then what you have to have is a grants. Hmm. And not only is a grants hard to come by, it's rarely the right thing for a business. Interesting. Yeah. Is, no, I, I remember uh, we when we were at War Room actually uh, a few weeks back in in uh, Beverly Hills. Um, Ryan actually made a comment about how if you've got partners and you and your partners aren't fighting fairly frequently, 
then one partner in your business is probably irrelevant. <laughs> so, you know, it's yeah. kind of a good thing if you're challenging each other and uh, not, I mean, the vision needs to be on the same page, but, you know, the mechanisms to get there, I think it is okay to have a little bit of controversy and a little bit of debate over it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. As long as it's constructive, Challenge. yeah. Friction, you know Friction. what I mean? They, they may not be irrelevant, um, but they're definitely checked out. Um, which, which is just as dangerous, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, we, when we're on our off sites, um, with our leadership team, um, one of the things that, I mean, I love Patrick Lancioni, everything he writes is, is amazing. I love the five mm -hmm. dysfunctions of a team as, as he goes in and, and he talks about these, you know, this, this fear of conflict, you need to have a healthy amount of conflict in your executive team. So we really set the ground rules, um, and, and empower people to be challengers. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but we also give a framework. Do I need, and, and when we're asking for, um, or when we're laying something out, we'll say, I, I need you to be the critic right now. Mm. And that's, you are free to challenge. You're free to innovate. You're free. Like, tell me why this can't work. I've done a lot of uh, research. I've put a lot into figuring it out, or we have, you know, blue ocean. Like mm. I need you to think bigger. Which one do I want you to be? Do I need more ideas or do I need you to, to, to attack critically the one that I've presented. Mm. Um, so we want conflict because if everyone's in agreement, then we're growing at this, uh, 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 we're, we're growing uh, at the speed of uh, uh, relaxation. Mm -hmm. No one's no, no one is, is uh, at all put out. No one is forced to grow. Everyone can still kind of dial it in. So if, if we're not forced to grow, then no one's challenging. If no one's challenging, then we're, we're, we're complacent. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we need, and, and I believe at digital marketer, we've got a mission that matters. I believe at all of our companies, um, you know, we, we are changing segments of the world, segments of the business population We're we are doing good work. So it's our job mm -hmm. to get that out there. And I believe everyone who can say the same thing, like you've got to, you've got to put people in place that are hungry. You've got to keep hung, hungry people hungry. Mm -hmm. That's huge, man. And and that's the difference between, and you kind of alluded to it, is incremental growth to something that's exponential. Something, and even if it's just yeah. small things, you know, it's like, let's not just be comfortable all the time if that's not what right. you want. And I don't think DM's a lifestyle business. So <laughs> yeah, you guys yeah, are always pushing it. Yeah. It's, I mean, we've got a big office and we come to work and, and, you know, Ryan and I are here every day. And, um, yeah. because I think, I think lifestyle businesses are, are tough. Uh, they don't align with, with me, uh, and, and what I want to do, mm -hmm. um, because I want to, I want to go all in on something. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I'll go all in on something else. So I, I truly believe in, and I didn't know, I believe it until I heard Ryan said it. He said, man, if, if, if you put me up against a lifestyle business, I'm going to win because I'm just going to outwork you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you're on the beach, when you're over here, when you're doing these things, I'm going to be at the office for 12 hours a day. In the beginning, maybe more. I'm going to build a team so that when I'm sleeping, they're working. I'm going to invest in systems and software. I'm going to build something that has value and it's going to gobble you up, not because you're not smart enough, mm -hmm. just because it's going to outwork you. Hmm. And yeah. that, that, you know, I want to build something that, that is going to do that, is going to have massive value. And then when I'm done building it, decide whether what, what relaxation looks like for me. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, is yeah. that consulting is that chilling on the beach somewhere probably not because that sounds terrible um but that sounds terrible to me <laughs> plenty of people who love that. yeah well what is the yeah. vision say it again i was just gonna say the kind of last thought there is like you know you can't grow at the speed of your own comfort because that's not growth at yeah. best you're treading water yeah mm. You would really like that book you squared, actually, because yeah. this is exactly what it says. Uh, That's awesome. Well, I'm gonna go for it. Uh, so I, I have, I have one more, one more quick question along these lines, and it, it's more of just to like feed my own curiosity. But I know, <laughs> uh, so digital marketer, you you you're kind of like an umbrella with a, a, a bunch of brands underneath it. You know, you've got your your DIY site, and you've got a a business in the uh, like prepper space, and you've got all these other businesses. Is that are those like individual owners like? babies or was that like a uh like you all 
came together and decided like we need to do something in this space we need to do something in this space or was like perry going hey we need to we need to have something in the prepper space i'll head that one up like did do people kind of own the different assets in the business but not like own from like an equity standpoint but like own as like the sure. taking ownership of those yeah so we have to have a gm i mean that's one of our roles is mm. or one of our rules as we as we have these uh, someone has to ultimately be in charge right someone has to uh, while we can have shared resources, um, a GM makes for a terrible shared resource because they're never going to fight for one brand and one brand only. Right. Um, so that's the that's kind of the question of ownership. Get that one out of the way because that one's easy. Uh, how we got to the the portfolio of companies we have now is very, I mean, entrepreneurial, right? Mm -hmm. It was uh, every opportunity and every idea was fed at the same rate. Um, which was which was challenging because a lot a lot of good ideas died along the way. A lot of good ideas um, scared the hell out of mediocrity. A lot of good ideas um, did a little bit better, but nothing just crushed um, because we were on this shared resource model, which we had to fine tune. And when we split and, and, and ownership in these portfolio companies, we were able to build teams in and around those businesses. So we built teams that specialized at B two B. We built built teams that specialized at uh, B to C, right? Because they're fundamentally different models, and they have diff they serve different people. So you have to understand who you serve, and be able to to understand their average day to be able to speak to them, whether or not you're speaking to them from a, a customer service standpoint or from a marketing or sales standpoint. Uh, so splitting those out into those two groups really helped uh, to build. So actually, the the companies that you were talking about, kind of the the DIY, uh, the survival life, uh, and and those aren't under the same umbrella as digital marketer. Mm. So they're in a different, uh, they're in a different brands or portfolio company that's owned by the same holding company, mm -hmm. not in the same group of brands as digital marketer. Digital marketer has digital marketer and, and war room and Praxio and true conversion, uh, and online marketing Institute, uh, and traffic and conversion summit. Those are the six brands that are kind of under uh, this holding company because all of those different products serve businesses. Mm -hmm. So again, back to making sure that we're grouping people together that, that are talking to the same people, that understand the same model, but that understand you're gonna have to deal with a business owner or a, a professional differently than you're going to a consumer. Uh, and you can't toggle back and forth being empathetic to those two people, uh, uh, one support ticket after the next, right? right. Eventually, it's gonna become generic. Yeah. So. There are owners, there are GMs. We split them up based on who you serve, not what you sell. Um, and, and kind of a, yeah. Mm, that the makes rest, total sense. Cool. Yeah. Rest kind of works itself out. Yeah, no, I can see that. And I love that because it goes back to that whole plate spinning analogy because I know Matt and I have definitely hit those walls where, you know, you get the momentum building and then you kind of move focus to something else that is kind of building still. And then that thing starts to go off the rails or decline a little bit. And you're like, ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, need to allocate resources again. But it sounds like right. having a GM or at least having uh, a good you know, team. I didn't. I know we didn't even get into the whole marketing team thing that we were. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was kind hey, of the next rabbit hole I was going to try two. to touch on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, this maybe this I'll is a good you. time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, real quick, you just hit on something there that's so important, though, mm. right? Because so every mo every Monday morning, I have a meeting with our leadership team, and the leadership team is there, and we go through each one of those six portfolio companies, and we say, what are the uh, what are the one to three most critical things that must happen at Digital Marketer this week? Okay, at True Conversion, here, here, here. And we we have that conversation without any constraints. Mm -hmm. And at the end, we then identify, because we do have a shared resource model. We have shared resource in creative. Um, so graphics and video and and copy to some extent. Um, we have shared resources in in, in, uh, in legal and accounting and in people and culture. So there are these shared resources. So there are times that multiple business entities are competing for the same time slot, right? The right. same resource trying to figure. And that's why you need a GM to sell it. Right. Mm. But as executives, we have to say kind of who eats in yeah. that meeting. There are plenty of times where we say this company has the, um, ramp and runway to be bigger than digital marketer in six months. Unfortunately, right now it's not. 
it can wait a week. Digital marketer can't. So even though we have to out again, back to the opportunity cost, can it wait a week? Okay, great. Digital marketer gets the resource or digital marketer can wait a week. And this company gets through. Someone has to make those decisions. What we've done is we've pulled those decisions up to the executive level. So every Monday we're knowing uh, where we have uh, kind of where we have bottlenecks. We mm-hmm. get to identify and, and, and we've got, you know, someone from people and culture in there going, Hey guys, this is the fifth time in two months that graphics has been kind of a bottleneck that we've been fighting over this. I'm going to propose that we hire someone there. Mm. Or when looking at the shared resource, this person who's in graphics is spending over 80% of their time creating graphics for digital marketer. I'm going to make a recommendation that we hire to replace that person, pull that person down directly onto digital marketer because it's now grown outgrown the shared resource model for this role. Mm, It gives us, we are knowingly committing our resources every Monday morning. We also know what could be if we had more. So we're pointing our resources at the right place. That's interesting. I like that a lot. So the Monday morning meetings and who's on like, so you said it's a leadership team call. So what kind of yep. leaders are we talking? Who's, what are the roles? So um, it's Ryan and it's myself, mm-hmm. right? We're there um, kind of in, almost in the same operator capacity that we would be uh, a digital marketer without the CEO kind of president right. role. It's, you know, we're, we're principal founders there. Mm-hmm. Then we have uh, the head of marketing, the head of product, uh, the head of sales, the head of partnership, um, the head of people and culture. I'm trying to think. Of, I remember, I'm going to feel really terrible if I remembered it or forgot anyone. Uh, <laughs> and the head of technology. Technology. Okay. Got yeah. it. Yeah. That seems to cover it all. And I could see how that is so valuable every morning or every Monday hitting on yeah. Yeah, the goals. I'm assuming like KPIs are probably being talked about to see if you're on track for, for the goals from previous weeks or months. Do you guys, do you guys kind of do that and have these mile markers quarterly or uh, things kind of time periods you're looking at with KPIs? Yeah. So we look at um, the KPIs. Uh, we have kind of just general revenue KPIs mm-hmm. at the, at the scalable company, right? When we're looking at our scalable companies, which is our, our holding company for all of the, the business portfolio. Um, mm-hmm. And so we have certain revenue goals there yeah. uh, as we break down into the individual kind of platforms or individual brands will have different KPIs depending on kind of what our, what, what our sprint is, what our, what our wig and our rocks are that quarter. Uh, we're always going to reevaluate uh, rocks and wigs on a quarterly basis. Sometimes we'll set them for six months if they're bigger, but we'll have, we'll break them down into milestones. Mm-hmm. But the company digital marketer and its leadership is having a meeting every Monday as well. Mm. Praxio is having a meeting uh, just in all hands right now, because Paxio is only uh, six people. So their all hands meeting is enough to both check KPIs, set, uh, set goals and inform what's going on. Where digital marketers got 50 people. We can't have 50 people setting goals. Right. So we have our, our, you know, kind of our wig meeting on Mondays, checking in on goals. And then we have our all hands, which is there to inform the company on, on what we're doing. Are we doing what we said we, we would do? Is it working? And where do we need help? So it's it's interesting as these companies mature how the the meeting cadence changes, but but making sure that you understand like what is the purpose behind this and what KPIs are we looking at at this meeting versus the next one and and why. I like yeah. that. Now, if if we were to like step back and and maybe look at like a, a companies that aren't quite the size of digital marketer, but maybe they're you know they're adding portfolio companies under their business. So a, a good example is Joe and I. We actually co-own a business in the home brewing space. It's a niche business that you know teaches people how to brew their own beer at home, and it's it's a, a fairly f- a small site. We we acquired the business from another company, and right now it doesn't really generate enough revenue for us to feel like we're justified in hiring a team to run it. So I'm kind of curious, where, where do you feel that cutoff point is? When should they start? When when should companies start building this team versus continuing to bootstrap it themselves? So I love the hybrid model right now when you're looking at, especially for a marketing team. And and this works for a growth team as well. Like, you know, traditionally you kind of looked at uh, one of two models 
right? It was either I'm going to completely outsource all of my marketing or I'm going to completely insource and build this in-house team. Now, I think um, the, the right model for everyone, including digital marketers, is this hybrid model. Mm-hmm. Uh, to what degree hybrid kind of is where uh, the size of the company comes in, right? We have a, a fairly large marketing team, but we still leverage agencies. Um, we, could have a, we could have no marketing team. And 100% leverage agencies. So I think focusing on a hybrid model and making sure that that you say, okay, um, one, what is our native genius? What are our core competence? Is that marketing? Uh, is it marketing strategy? Right? Are we able to? Uh, are, are we able to come up with a strategy we 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 know uh, needs to be deployed to uh, achieve these goals? If so, perfect. Come up with a strategy. Figure out what you can deploy internally with your existing bandwidth and then start to, you know, open up Excel, build some pivot tables. I don't know, take your shoes off so that you can count with your toes. It doesn't matter, (laughs) Uh, but figure out what is that inflection point, right? When can you move over it? What does your, what do your revenues need to be or your profits need to be to be able to kind of move to an agency model where you can uh, have them doing some of those things to where you can now uh, double down on what you're good at. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so with you guys, I would say uh, a couple of things like it. So l- let's flip the let's flip the roles here. I'll, I'll interview you you guys for a second. Mm-hmm. You obviously <laughs> bought this this company from another person, probably one because it was an amazing opportunity. I'm guessing that one or both of you also enjoys microbreweries or uh, brewing at home or has some interest or passion in it. Would that right. be yep. somewhat accurate? That is. Right? Yeah. Has the business grown since you've bought since you acquired it? Since we acquired, not revenue st- uh, wise, but uh, in terms of traffic, yes, traffic okay. and, and list and growth. And yes. list growth. Yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. Why would you? Uh, w- okay, let me ask. Let's pause. Let me ask that differently. Um, <laughs> what if you spent an additional ten hours a week on it? Would it would it grow exponentially? Would it have mild growth? Would it have marginal growth? No growth at all. I would say. It has the the potential for exponential growth, a hundred percent. Yeah, ten hours is a it, week. Is it time and focus? So keeping you from that? Yes, that's hundred percent it. Yep. Do you know what needs to happen? Uh, yeah, actually, we have a. I would okay. say we have a pretty good vision. Yeah. Great. So it seems like you need to deploy the hybrid model in some capacity mm-hmm. because if you are if you already know what needs to happen, you can clearly articulate that to someone. You may not. It may not be time to hire a full time person. But to speak to someone who could do that either, uh, heck, maybe you partner with another person. Maybe you partner with an operator. Maybe mm-hmm. what you're missing is an operator. You guys have the strategy. Uh, you bring in an operator who wants to be there day in and day out, and you dedicate some resources. Um, obviously, you're going to expend capital, potentially, mm-hmm. depending on how large you've grown the business. Um, maybe you could have someone buy in, reinvest that capital. Either way, mm-hmm. someone should be doing those things you know need to be done. I would recommend going and saying, we understand marketing, right? So I don't need someone who's gonna be a marketing strategy. That's more of what we already got. Right. Uh, we, could, we could probably do it. Most of us don't do stuff that we could do. Like at home, I don't cut my yard, not mm-hmm. because I think I'm too good to do it, but I start to, uh, I start to weigh out what I could be doing, right? Mm-hmm. My family. Mm-hmm. I, I love spending time with my family. Uh, believe it or not, I spend a lot of time at work. You guys can probably uh, yeah. uh, relate to that. Definitely. So I don't, I don't get joy from cutting. I don't derive any joy from cutting my yard. Mm-hmm. Right? It needs to get done. That's why it gets done. At some point, I could do it. Mm-hmm. Or I could spend time with my family. I'm not going to take a principal stance and handcuff myself to a lawnmower because, by God, I could do this. Mm-hmm. But when we go into a professional standpoint, we do that. You guys obviously have uh, a talent and native genius at, at marketing and, and the things that you're doing. So they're not being done as, as often as they should be over on this other side. And you're not hiring someone or partnering with someone or hiring an agency because you should do it. Yeah. Because you know how to do it. You have the core competence. At some point, you're not doing it because you're not doing it. There's a reason and it matters, but it doesn't. The only thing that matters is it's not being done. So you can be fundamentally right or the business can grow. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't mean you have to go higher. Right. Yeah. And, and you know what? Sounds like you got a business teaching people how to do something that's enjoyable, relaxing, uh, is a passion, is a hobby, could maybe turn into a career. So you kind of fall into that category of your 
responsibility is to get that information and, and to promote that business or those products and get them into the hands of many people as possible. Mm. Uh, Doesn't have to be you that's doing it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think I think in retrospect, the thing, the mistake we made <laughs> was actually not keeping the original owner around to continue to run yeah. it, and then just oh, yeah. deploying our assets and expertise into what he's already doing. Um, but that's a you know that that, that hey, that's a whole different rabbit hole. <laughs> but that's a perfect, that was something we yeah. we learned from Roland. If you're going right. to buy a business, you know, go in and don't buy all the business. Go in and buy. Uh, most of the business, keep the operator there, give them a salary and the ability to uh, increase their ownership. And that's the, especially if you bring in that, that marketing skill, right? If you can increase mm -hmm. the value, if you can increase traffic, increase leads, increase sales, whatever it is that you bring to the table, uh, that doesn't negate the need for someone to be there and operate the business. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. that's a lesson we've all learned by not doing it <laughs> and yeah. going like, what do you know? I couldn't actually run 14 businesses. <laughs> <laughs> no. But I could do everything. I'm an entrepreneur <laughs> all the time <laughs> in the world. <laughs> no. But I think so big. Yeah. When it, when it comes to compensation, I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, specifically for in-house team members, obviously not agencies, do you have any sort of compensation plans that are tied to performance? Are, are they getting bonuses based on revenue? Is there, you know, how, how do you keep in, employees motivated financially to, to grow with the company? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and there's so many different uh, opinions on this out there. Um, for us, I'm not... I'm not of the camp that everyone needs to be on some form of variable comp, mm -hmm. um, especially as we move into um, you know, a millennial workforce. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, I'm talking to our executives now, and and our executives want to know that they're a part of something, that they're paid fairly uh, at or above market, that they have the opportunity to grow, to grow, but more importantly, that they are being. Um, uh, they are being invested in personally and professionally in their growth. Mm -hmm. So yeah. making sure that you know kind of what the workforce cares about for me, I, I am, listen, I'm a pure capitalist. Mm -hmm. Like I love that making an impact. I have to have some purpose in there. Um, but if it's, if it's not making money, then that's like, that's not enough, right? It needs to be purpose plus profit. Mm -hmm. um, so, right. but, but that's just not, how the, the new workforce is is motivated. So for us, it's it's culture. We bring people in with culture. We bring people in with a mission, with being a part of something. We we train them. We give people skills. I I I make sure our leadership knows that we're not in the business of of trading time for money, right? With our employees, like that's not that's not what it means to hire someone at any of our companies, like we are charged with making them better in every way, shape or form. I heard Chris Hogan uh, say one time, uh, a manager can make someone better at their job. Mm -hmm. A leader can make someone better at their life. Mm. That's we so are true. to leave people better than we found them. Like we, we invest in people and in, in how to have difficult conversations, how to set uh, like time management and how, how to uh, prioritize things in your life. You don't, ha you don't get real good at conflict resolution at work and go home and be a giant jackass, mm. right? Like right. you're better with your with your spouse or your significant other. You're be better with your siblings. You're better with those important relationships in your life, and you feel that, right? You feel that. Oh yeah. And when it's appropriate, we pay variable comp. Um, but I'm not trying to contort my business to pay variable comp uh, because it's not what's motivating at or above market rate. And, and let them be a part of something, give them an opportunity to grow, tell them how that's going to happen, uh, empower them to do it, educate them. And you know what? Maybe they'll grow internally. Maybe they'll, they won't, maybe they'll grow here to a, to a degree and then they'll leave. They'll always leave your company in a better place than they found it. And you'll always leave them in a better place than you found them. And that mm. happens. Mm. Business is not family. You can't fire a family. I mean, I guess you can, uh, but we rarely fire a family member. Right. Right. It's, it's really like you're not sitting around in the holidays and you're like, you know what? Uh, you know, Aunt Cindy, get the hell out. Never come back. I'm like, tired of your happen. casserole. Right. right. Every year. You're, you were late again. This has to stop. Uh, that, that's not going to happen. Yeah. But we tell, we tell our offices that we're family and then we fire family. 
It's, it's difficult. Like get okay with people leaving. If not, you're going to be constantly disappointed. You're going to, you're going to apply the wrong framework to the relationship. Uh, and then you're going to be inappropriate. And I don't mean in like a, a HR violation, inappropriate kind of right, way. Right. Um, but I don't know. So compensation, I, I want to get to a level where the executive team or a leadership team at a, at a holding company uh, where there's some sort of profit share because you need to compensate on the things that are important. Like yep. top line revenue is going to increase the value uh, of a company. Um, but really what matters in, in, in companies that you have no desire to sell or you just want to be profitable is profit. So, hmm. you know, compensate people on, on profit when they can affect all aspects of it. Hmm. Um, yes. They have to be in control of that KPI. That was something that Roland told us. We actually posed a simpler, similar uh, question to him about compensation. And if they can control KPI, especially like profit, for instance, then um, you can kind of build in something that way. Yeah. Right. If not, it's just mean. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> if, yeah. You know, and, and we'll all do the things that we are uh, incentivized monetarily to do. Right. Right. So yeah. where, where comp plans go poorly is when um, the activity that will allow someone to earn more isn't in alignment with um, the activity you want them doing. Mm -hmm. Because it's just human nature. If I have the opportunity to go earn more, even if I'm not financially driven, I'm, 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 I'm logical. Right. I'm going to go do that thing. Um, and, and really I should because the person putting together that comp plan should put one together that is in alignment with the company's growth goals. Uh, and if yeah. it's not, then it's not my fault for logically uh, going, well, okay, if they're, if they're giving me more money to do this and these are the activities I, I should prioritize. Yeah. yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah, no, that, that, that's been something we've been, we've been juggling lately because we, we don't have a very large team. I think we're working with about eight people mm -hmm. right now on our team total. And we had one week yeah. uh, a couple weeks ago where I actually had two people leave our team in the same week and kind of you know, lit a fire in our business, but, uh, uh, we, we've since got past that, but I'm always kind of curious, you know, what are, what are some other ways other companies are, are keeping their team motivated and, you know, it doesn't always have to be financial motivation, although I do know that is a big motivator for a lot of people. Sure. Mm -hmm. I'll give you the steps and, and I don't know, we, we may be nearing, uh, the end, but <laughs> let me just leave you with some steps on what it looks like yeah, to advance please. Thank you. In, in our company. So one, I have a spiel and it starts off with the only thing that, that you can earn at this company is an opportunity. And let me be very, very clear. Your butt in that seat means you already have one because the role that you currently occupy is an opportunity for uh, a, a list of people who aren't inside of these walls. So never forget that what you're doing now is an opportunity and you can't get the next opportunity without doing the following things. Step one, be ridiculously good at your job even if you don't like it, that's it. Mm. That's how you know that you're a professional. Yeah. Be ridiculously good at your job, even if you don't like it. Step two, document the systems and processes that allow you to be ridiculously good at your job. Step three, train someone else, grab a buddy, see if they can do your job to 80% of your competence following those documents and systems. If so, good chance that you've done a good job documenting. If not, go back through them again until they can. Mm -hmm. Step four, wait for an opportunity to present itself. See, alignment is such a big thing in our company. Just because you're ready and you've earned opportunity doesn't mean that the company should expedite opportunity. We take the social responsibility of hiring very seriously. When I'm hiring someone, I'm, 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 I'm taking them and I'm committing to them and their family and the people who love them and the people that care about them, that as long as they do what they say they're going to do, that we're going to do what we say we're going to do. And if I don't know beyond the shadow of a doubt that I can do that, I can't hire. Hmm. Because if you hire them, you're going to look them in the face and fire them if it comes to that. That's just it. Yeah. Right. But yeah. those are, so if I open up an opportunity early because I like you, I put everybody else's job at risk. So you earn the opportunity and you know what? Sometimes you wait. And sometimes you wait and the opportunity becomes available inside this company. Sometimes you wait and the opportunity becomes available outside of this company. And you know what? If you have to take it, we'll wish you all the luck in the world. If we can't, in good conscience, give you that opportunity right now without jeopardizing everyone else, can't do it. Or without changing the plan or the focus of the company's trajectory, can't do it. 
doesn't mean you didn't earn it. Mm-hmm. And I end with, I need you to separate your self-worth from your salary. Because you know what I will never be? Paid what I'm worth. There is never a time where I will be paid what I'm worth. There's never a time where Ryan will be paid what he's worth. Never a time where Roland will be paid what he's worth or Perry or anyone else for that matter. Worth and what you get paid have to be separated because one is determined by the market and the other is determined by you. Hmm. The only thing you can ever earn here is opportunity. That's how you earn it. Man. You're, you're growing, you're, you're educating people for life right there. Like those four rules right there can be spread so far and wide, you know, anywhere in life. It's amazing. Yeah. Thank you for those. Well, yeah, you. That's, yeah, I'd say it's a pretty, pretty good way to wrap up there. Yeah. Um, we did want to ask you know, just, and this could be a total quick, quick one is the vision or the mission for DM digital marketer. Cause you kind of hinted at that. I just wanted to kind of wrap it up and hear it from you. What is the vision for D- digital marketer maybe in the next, you know, handful of years coming up here? Yeah. So our mission is to double the size of 10,000 businesses, um, in the next five years. Like that's, that's our, our vision. We want to uh, do that by, you know, open sourcing, uh, strategies that 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 we've proven that work, um, you know, by um, by enabling business owners or dentists or whoever you may be uh, with uh, the marketing chops to go and do what needs to be done. See, we believe that um, the best dentist should win, not the best marketer marketing dentist. So, how do we do that? Like, I don't want our dentists to be amazing marketers. I want to be able to create certifications and trainings and systemized processes that the best dentist can hand off to someone and create an amazing marketer to grow their practice. So Mm. uh, we believe in the democratization of, of kind of marketing information. We believe in leveling the playing field. So we want to double the size of 10,000 small businesses by, by doing that. It's the vision of digital marketer. But as we stepped into this portfolio of brands that serve businesses, we realized it's the mission of all of them. Mm-hmm. Like our job is our, our, our passion, our goal is to enable businesses to grow, right? Yeah. To, to take what we know or to go find that, to create processes for systems that are proven and to open source them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so whether it's software or, or education or tools or, or templates, doesn't matter. That's what we do because we do believe that Entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs and small business are the backbone of this economy. We believe that we can change world economies uh, if if we enable the right people to win. So we want to enable the right people to win. The people who truly care about their customers, who truly have an exceptional product or service. By God, we want to get the word out there about them. Uh, we can only do that so much, but but we can definitely walk beside them and enable them uh, with the things that we know work. So that's our mission. That's what we wake up passionate about. That's awesome, man. You guys are doing it too. You're rocking it in so many ways (laughs) in all the different businesses you have. Yeah, Yeah, man. Really appreciate that. No, this is, this has probably been one of my favorite discussions we've had on this podcast. And I I say that in all sincerity, this is honestly just, I really love this conversation. We've gone an hour and eight minutes now. So we're a few minutes over Mm. what we promised you, but um, (laughs) thank you. (laughs) No, thanks for spending the extra time with us. We really, really appreciate it. Um, Obviously we want people to go to digitalmarketer.com after this. Is there anywhere else that you'd want to send people um, after listening to this episode? Yeah, check out Praxio.com. Uh, if, if you need to kind of document your systems and processes, uh, we believe that Praxio is going to be a way for you to uh, uh, have an internal knowledge base to, to duplicate your best people, right? You, you talk about those four steps and, and how do you earn opportunity. We, uh, we realized that there was a need to, to create a platform that, that became kind of the brains of your company. And, and we think selfishly that we've done it. So uh, if, if you're looking at, how to document the things that are uh, that that are really working in your business, so that uh, you can build upon them. Uh, if you need to to figure out how to train people or onboard new people, I wish you'd go to Praxio.com, check it out. We've got a free trial. Uh, I think you'll like it. Awesome. I just went to Praxio, and I don't know why I've never been there. I'm sorry, Richard. <laughs> and I just looked at well, like, dear God, this is really cool. <laughs> All these we templates. think so. We've yeah. it's been on the hush hush for a little while. We've been uh, developing yeah. that internally and in, in alpha and beta phases for about a year and a half, uh, a little bit longer. If you look at the technology that we built that powered digital marketer that we kind of pulled over into this. So uh, we're really excited about it. Uh, hopefully 
uh, we're going to, we're going to kind of put on our marketing hat in the next couple of months and, uh, and really get the word out. But for those of you guys listening to this amazing podcast, I hope you'll go check it out. Uh, give us your feedback. Awesome, man. Cool. Well, thank you very much for your time and uh, we'll let you go. I know we're already well over. <laughs> so appreciate this, Richard. And, uh, we'll definitely right, chat soon. I, I appreciate it guys. All right, Matt, Joe, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Mm, mm, sh, mm, mm. Thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of the Hustle and Flowchart podcast. For taking the time to listen, we want to give you something a little bit special. Every single episode that we do, we actually have somebody on our team take notes. We basically have a Cliff's Notes version of every episode where you can go and find all of the tips and tactics that they laid out, all of the resources that they laid out. All the good stuff from this episode, we actually have a nice, simple notes version that you can find on our website. So go to evergreenprofits.com, find this episode that you just listened to, and uh, give us your email address, and we'll send you the notes. Thanks for listening. Go get it. Wiki, wiki.